The sound barrier or sonic barrier is the sudden increase in aerodynamic drag and other undesirable effects experienced by an aircraft or other object when it approaches the speed of sound. When aircraft first began to be able to reach close to the speed of sound, these effects were seen as constituting a barrier making faster speeds very difficult or impossible. The term sound barrier is still sometimes used today to refer to aircraft reaching supersonic flight. In dry air at 20 degrees Celsius 68 degrees Fahrenheit, the speed of sound is 343 meters per second about 767 miles per hour, 1,234 kilometers per hour or 1,125 feet per second. The term came into use during World War II when pilots of high-speed fighter aircraft experienced the effects of compressibility, a number of adverse aerodynamic effects that deterred further acceleration, seemingly impeding flight at speeds close to the speed of sound. These difficulties represented a barrier to flying at faster speeds. In 1947 it was demonstrated that safe flight at the speed of sound was achievable in purpose-designed aircraft thereby breaking the barrier. By the 1950s new designs of fighter aircraft routinely reached the speed of sound, and faster. History Some common whips such as the bull whip or stock whip are able to move faster than sound, the tip of the whip exceeds this speed and causes a sharp crack—literally a sonic boom. Firearms made after the 19th century have generally had a supersonic muzzle velocity. The sound barrier may have been first breached by living beings some 150 million years ago. Some paleobiologists report that, based on computer models of their biomechanical capabilities, certain long tailed dinosaurs such as Apatosaurus and Diplodocus may have been able to flick their tails at supersonic speeds, creating a cracking sound. This finding is theoretical and disputed by others in the field. Meteors entering the Earth's atmosphere usually, if not always, descend faster than sound. <laughs> Early problems The tip of the propeller on many early aircraft may reach supersonic speeds, producing a noticeable buzz that differentiates such aircraft. This is undesirable, as the transonic air movement creates disruptive shock waves and turbulence. It is due to these effects that propellers are known to suffer from dramatically decreased performance as they approach the speed of sound. It is easy to demonstrate that the power needed to improve performance is so great that the weight of the required engine grows faster than the power output of the propeller can compensate. This problem was one that led to early research into jet engines, notably by Frank Whittle in England and Hans von Owen in Germany, who were led to their research specifically in order to avoid these problems in high-speed flight. Nevertheless, propeller aircraft were able to approach the critical Mach number in a dive. Unfortunately, doing so led to numerous crashes for a variety of reasons. Most infamously, in the Mitsubishi Zero, pilots flew at full power into the terrain because the rapidly increasing forces acting on the control surfaces of their aircraft overpowered them. In this case, several attempts to fix it only made the problem worse. Likewise, the flexing caused by the low torsional stiffness of the supermarine Spitfire's wings caused them, in turn, to counteract aileron control inputs, leading to a condition known as control reversal. This was solved in later models with changes to the wing. Worse still, a particularly dangerous interaction of the airflow between the wings and tail surfaces of diving Lockheed P-38 Lightnings made pulling out of dives difficult. However, the problem was later solved by the addition of a dive flap. That upset the airflow under these circumstances. Flutter due to the formation of shock waves on curved surfaces was another major problem, which led most famously to the breakup of de Havilland's swallow and death of its pilot, Geoffrey de Havilland Jr. 27 September 1946. A similar problem is thought to have been the cause of the 1943 crash of the Bi-1 rocket aircraft in the Soviet Union. All of these effects, although unrelated in most ways, led to the concept of a barrier, making it difficult for an aircraft to exceed the speed of sound. Erroneous news reports caused most people to envision the sound barrier as a physical wall, which supersonic aircraft needed to break with a sharp needle nose on the front of the fuselage. 
Rocketry and artillery experts' products routinely exceeded Mach 1, but aircraft designers and aerodynamic engineers during and after World War II discussed Mach 0.7 as a limit dangerous to exceed. <laughs> Early claims During World War II and immediately thereafter, a number of claims were made that the sound barrier had been broken in a dive. The majority of these purported events can be dismissed as instrumentation errors. The typical airspeed indicator ASI uses air pressure differences between two or more points on the aircraft, typically near the nose and at the side of the fuselage, to produce a speed figure. At high speed, the various compression effects that lead to the sound barrier also cause the ASI to go non-linear and produce inaccurately high or low readings, depending on the specifics of the installation. This effect became known as Mach jump. Before the introduction of Mach meters, accurate measurements of supersonic speeds could only be made externally, normally using ground-based instruments. Many claims of supersonic speeds were found to be far below this speed when measured in this fashion. In 1942, Republic Aviation issued a press release stating that LTs Harold E. Comstock and Roger Dyer had exceeded the speed of sound during test dives in the P-47 Thunderbolt. It is widely agreed that this was due to inaccurate ASI readings. In similar tests, the North American P-51 Mustang, a higher performance aircraft, demonstrated limits at Mach 0.85, with every flight over M0.84 causing the aircraft to be damaged by vibration. One of the highest recorded instrumented Mach numbers attained for a propeller aircraft is the Mach 0.891 for a Spitfire PR-11, flown during dive tests at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, Farnborough in April 1944. The Spitfire, a photo reconnaissance variant, the Mark 11, fitted with an extended rake type multiple pitot system, was flown by squadron leader J. R. Tobin to this speed, corresponding to a corrected true airspeed Tasmania of 606 miles per hour. In a subsequent flight, squadron leader Anthony Martindale achieved Mach 0.92, but it ended in a forced landing after over revving damaged the engine. In the 1990s, Hans Guido Mutke claimed to have broken the sound barrier on the 9th of April 1945 in the Messerschmitt Me 262 jet aircraft. He states that his ASI pegged itself at 1,100 km per hour, 680 miles per hour. Mutka reported not just transonic buffeting but the resumption of normal control once a certain speed was exceeded, then a resumption of severe buffeting once the Mi-262 slowed again. He also reported engine flameout. This claim is widely disputed, even by pilots in his unit. All of the effects he reported are known to occur on the Mi-262 at much lower speeds, and the ASI reading is simply not reliable in the transonic. Further, a series of tests made by Carl Dirch at the behest of Willy Messerschmitt found that the plane became uncontrollable above Mach 0.86, and at Mach 0.9 would nose over into a dive that could not be recovered from. Post-war tests by the RAF confirmed these results, with the slight modification that the maximum speed using new instruments was found to be Mach 0.84, rather than Mach 0.86. In 1999, Mutka enlisted the help of Professor Otto Wagner of the Munich Technical University to run computational tests to determine whether the aircraft could break the sound barrier. These tests do not rule out the possibility, but are lacking accurate data on the coefficient of drag that would be needed to make accurate simulations. Wagner stated, I don't want to exclude the possibility, but I can imagine he may also have been just below the speed of sound and felt the buffeting, but did not go above Mach 1. One bit of evidence presented by Mutka is on page 13 of the Mi 262A1 Pilot's Handbook, issued by Headquarters Air Materiel Command, Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, as report no. FSU 1111ND on January 10, 1946. Speeds of 950 km per hour, 590 miles per hour are reported to have been attained in a shallow dive 20 degrees to 30 degrees from the horizontal. No vertical dives were made. At speeds of 950 to 1000 km per hour, 590 to 620 miles per hour, the airflow around the aircraft reaches the speed of sound, and it is reported that the control surfaces no longer affect the direction of flight. The results vary with different airplanes, some wing over and dive while others dive gradually. 
It is also reported that once the speed of sound is exceeded, this condition disappears and normal control is restored. The comments about restoration of flight control and cessation of buffeting above Mach 1 are very significant in a 1946 document. However, it is not clear where these terms came from, as it does not appear the U.S. pilots carried out such tests. In his 1990 book ME 163, former Messerschmitt ME 163, Kome. Pilot Mano Ziegler claims that his friend, test pilot Heine Dittmar, broke the sound barrier while diving the rocket plane, and that several people on the ground heard the sonic booms. He claims that on 6 July 1944, Dittmar, flying Mi-163 BV-18, bearing the Stamkenzeichen alphabetic code VA plus SP, was measured traveling at a speed of 1,130 km per hour 702 miles per hour. However, no evidence of such a flight exists in any of the materials from that period, which were captured by Allied forces and extensively studied. Dittmar had been officially recorded at 1,004.5 km per hour miles per hour in level flight on 2 October 1941 in the prototype Mi-163 AV-4. He reached this speed at less than full throttle, as he was concerned by the transonic buffeting. Dittmar himself does not make a claim that he broke the sound barrier on that flight, and notes that the speed was recorded only on the AIS. He does, however, take credit for being the first pilot to knock on the sound barrier. The Luftwaffe test pilot Lothar Sieber April 7, 1922 to March 1, 1945, may have inadvertently become the first man to break the sound barrier on 1 March 1945. This occurred while he was piloting a Batchum Bar 349 Natter for the first manned vertical takeoff of a rocket in history. In 55 seconds, he traveled a total of 14 kilometers (8.7 miles). The aircraft crashed and he perished violently in this endeavor. There are a number of unmanned vehicles that flew at supersonic speeds during this period, but they generally do not meet the definition. In 1933, Soviet designers working on ramjet concepts fired phosphorus-powered engines out of artillery guns to get them to operational speeds. It is possible that this produced supersonic performance as high as Mach 2, but this was not due solely to the engine itself. In contrast, the German V-2 ballistic missile routinely broke the sound barrier in flight, for the first time on 3 October 1942. By September 1944, V-2s routinely achieved Mach 4 1,200 meters per second, or 3,044 miles per hour during terminal descent. Topic: <laughs> Breaking the sound barrier. In 1942, the United Kingdom's Ministry of Aviation began a top-secret project with Miles Aircraft to develop the world's first aircraft capable of breaking the sound barrier. The project resulted in the development of the prototype Miles M.52 turbojet powered aircraft, which was designed to reach 1000 miles per hour, 417 meters per second, 1600 kilometers per hour, over twice the existing speed record in level flight and to climb to an altitude of 36000 feet, 11 kilometers in 1 minute 30 seconds. A huge number of advanced features were incorporated into the resulting M.52 design, many of which hint at a detailed knowledge of supersonic aerodynamics. In particular, the design featured a conical nose and sharp wing leading edges, as it was known that round-nosed projectiles could not be stabilized at supersonic speeds. The design used very thin wings of biconvex section proposed by Jakob Akaray for low drag. The wing tips were clipped to keep them clear of the conical shock wave generated by the nose of the aircraft. The fuselage had the minimum cross-section allowable around the centrifugal engine with fuel tanks in a saddle over the top. Another critical addition was the use of a power-operated stabilator, also known as the all-moving tail or flying tail, a key to supersonic flight control which contrasted with traditional hinged tailplanes horizontal stabilizers connected mechanically to the pilot's control column. Conventional control surfaces became ineffective at the high subsonic speeds then being achieved by fighters in dives, due to the aerodynamic forces caused by the formation of shockwaves at the hinge and the rearward movement of the center of pressure, which together could override the control forces that could be applied mechanically by the pilot, hindering recovery from the dive. 
A major impediment to early transonic flight was control reversal, the phenomenon which caused flight inputs stick, rudder, to switch direction at high speed, it was the cause of many accidents and near accidents. An all-flying tail is considered to be a minimum condition of enabling aircraft to break the transonic barrier safely, without losing pilot control. The Miles M.52 was the first instance of this solution, and has since been universally applied. Initially, the aircraft was to use Frank Whittle's latest engine, the Power Jets W2700, which would only reach supersonic speed in a shallow dive. To develop a fully supersonic version of the aircraft, an innovation incorporated was a reheat jet pipe, also known as an afterburner. Extra fuel was to be burned in the tailpipe to avoid overheating the turbine blades, making use of unused oxygen in the exhaust. Finally, the design included another critical element, the use of a shock cone in the nose to slow the incoming air to the subsonic speeds needed by the engine. Although the project was eventually cancelled, the research was used to construct an unmanned missile that went on to achieve a speed of Mach 1.38 in a successful, controlled transonic and supersonic level test flight. This was a unique achievement at that time which validated the aerodynamics of the M.52. Meanwhile, test pilots achieved high velocities in the tailless, swept wing de Havilland DH-108. One of them was Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. who was killed on 27 September 1946 when his DH-108 broke up at about Mach 0.9. John Derry has been called, "...Britain's first supersonic pilot," because of a dive he made in a DH-108 on 6 September 1948. Topic. Sound barrier officially broken in aircraft The British Air Ministry signed an agreement with the United States to exchange all its high-speed research, data and designs and Bell Aircraft Company was given access to the drawings and research on the M.52, but the US reneged on the agreement and no data was forthcoming in return. Bell's supersonic design was still using a conventional tail and they were battling the problem of control. They utilized the information to initiate work on the Bell X-1. The final version of the Bell X-1 was very similar in design to the original Miles M.52 version. Also featuring the all-moving tail, the XS-1 was later known as the X-1. It was in the X-1 that Chuck Yeager was credited with being the first person to break the sound barrier in level flight on October 14, 1947, flying at an altitude of 45,000 feet George Welch made a plausible but officially unverified claim to have broken the sound barrier on 1 October 1947, while flying an XP-86 Sabre. He also claimed to have repeated his supersonic flight on October 14, 1947, 30 minutes before Jaeger broke the sound barrier in the Bell X-1. Although evidence from witnesses and instruments strongly imply that Welch achieved supersonic speed, the flights were not properly monitored and are not officially recognized. The XP-86 officially achieved supersonic speed on April 26, 1948, on 14 October 1947, just under a month after the United States Air Force had been created as a separate service. The tests culminated in the first manned supersonic flight, piloted by Air Force Captain Charles Chuck Yeager in aircraft number 46062, which he had christened Glamorous Glenis. The rocket-powered aircraft was launched from the bomb bay of a specially modified B-29 and glided to a landing on a runway. XS-1 Flight No. 50 is the first one where the X-1 recorded supersonic flight, at Mach 1.06 361 meters per second, 1,299 kilometers per hour, 807.2 miles per hour peak speed. However, Jaeger and many other personnel believe Flight No. 49 also with Jaeger piloting, which reached a top recorded speed of Mach 0.997 339 meters per second, 1,221 kilometers per hour may have, in fact, exceeded Mach 1. The measurements were not accurate to three significant figures and no sonic boom was recorded for that flight. As a result of the X-1's initial supersonic flight, the National Aeronautics Association voted its 1948 Collier Trophy to be shared by the three main participants in the program. Honored at the White House by President Harry S. Truman were Larry Bell for Bell Aircraft, Captain Yeager for piloting the flights, and John Stack for the NACA contributions. 
Jackie Cochran was the first woman to break the sound barrier on May 18, 1953, in a Canadair Sabre, with Jaeger as her wingman. On August 21, 1961, a Douglas DC-843 unofficially exceeded Mach 1 in a controlled dive during a test flight at Edwards Air Force Base, as observed and reported by the flight crew. The crew were William Magruder, pilot, Paul Patton, co-pilot, Joseph Tomic, flight engineer, and Richard H. Edwards, flight test engineer. This was the first supersonic flight by a civilian airliner, and the only one other than those by Concorde or the Tu-144. The sound barrier understood As the science of high-speed flight became more widely understood, a number of changes led to the eventual understanding that the sound barrier is easily penetrated, with the right conditions. Among these changes were the introduction of thin swept wings, the area rule, and engines of ever increasing performance. By the 1950s, many combat aircraft could routinely break the sound barrier in level flight, although they often suffered from control problems when doing so, such as Mach Tuck. Modern aircraft can transit the barrier without control problems. By the late 1950s, the issue was so well understood that many companies started investing in the development of supersonic airliners, or SSTs, believing that to be the next natural step in airliner evolution. However, this has not yet happened. Although the Concorde and the Tupolev Tu-144 entered service in the 1970s, both were later retired without being replaced by similar designs. The last flight of a Concorde in service was in 2003. Although Concorde and the Tu-144 were the first aircraft to carry commercial passengers at supersonic speeds, they were not the first or only commercial airliners to break the sound barrier. On 21 August 1961, a Douglas DC-8 broke the sound barrier at Mach 1.012 or 1,240 km per hour 776.2 miles per hour while in a controlled dive through 41,088 feet 12,510 meters. The purpose of the flight was to collect data on a new design of leading edge for the wing. A China Airlines 747 may have broken the sound barrier in an unplanned descent from 41,000 feet to 9,500 feet 2, meters after an in-flight upset on 19 February 1985. It also reached over 5 grams. <laughs> Breaking the sound barrier in a land vehicle On January 12, 1948, a Northrop unmanned rocket sled became the first land vehicle to break the sound barrier. At a military test facility at Murock Air Force Base now Edwards AFB, California, it reached a peak speed of 1,019 miles per hour before jumping the rails, on October 15, 1997, in a vehicle designed and built by a team led by Richard Noble, Royal Air Force pilot Andy Green became the first person to break the sound barrier in a land vehicle in compliance with Federation Internationale de l'Automobile rules. The vehicle, called the Thrust SSC supersonic car, captured the record 50 years and one day after Jaeger's first supersonic flight. <laughs> Breaking the sound barrier as a human projectile <laughs> Felix Baumgartner In October 2012 Felix Baumgartner, with a team of scientists and sponsor Red Bull, attempted the highest sky dive on record. The project would see Baumgartner attempt to jump 120,000 feet meters from a helium balloon and become the first parachutist to break the sound barrier. The launch was scheduled for October 9, 2012, but was aborted due to adverse weather. Subsequently the capsule was launched instead on October 14. 
Baumgartner's feat also marked the 65th anniversary of U.S. test pilot Chuck Yeager's successful attempt to break the sound barrier in an aircraft. Baumgartner landed in eastern New Mexico after jumping from a world record 128,100 feet (39,045 meters) or 24.26 miles, and broke the sound barrier as he traveled at speeds up to 833.9 miles per hour (1,342 kilometers per hour) or Mach 1.26. In the press conference after his jump, it was announced he was in freefall for 4 minutes, 18 seconds, the second longest freefall after the 1960 jump of Joseph Kittinger for 4 minutes, 36 seconds. <laughs> Alan Eustace In October 2014, Alan Eustace, a senior vice president at Google, broke Baumgartner's record for highest sky dive and also broke the sound barrier in the process. <laughs> Legacy David Lean directed The Sound Barrier, a fictionalized retelling of the de Havilland DH-108 test flights.